Welcome to our chemical science. This is possibly one of the most entertaining things I've ever stumbled upon. Call me silly, but I'm reasonably certain that what I'm about to show is exactly what the ancient game of chess was originally designed to teach. Harmonic intervals and the most important relationships between numbers. Although I've certainly never seen anyone else demonstrate 3D mathematics using the iconic chessboard and its pieces, I suspect many operational masons in the past may have taught their students some of the concepts I show in this video using the chessboard, and I'm not an operational mason, just transparency there. I don't have any evidence to back that up, it's just an educated hunch based on the significance placed on the checkerboard within Freemasonry and the fact that if you've done any research at all into the subject, um, pretty much nothing is coincidence in the symbolism used by the Freemasons. Most, if not all, of the operations obviously also exist in conventional mathematics in some form, but in this context they're often perceived as arbitrary or of minor significance. Here's the chessboard and the six different pieces of the royal court. A set of black and a set of white pieces. I'm going to use each different chess piece to demonstrate a key harmonic mathematical operation that can be performed on the chessboard. I'm just going to use the black and white colours arbitrarily at this stage, but I do have a new unverified yet theory of how the black pieces could actually show the polarised numbers or fractional harmonic number divisions inverse to the harmonic numbers that occur from the operations I perform in this video. In this respect, we could currently refer to the operations I demonstrate in this video as the white piece operations. So we could consider that the operations we can perform with the white pieces are very likely just one half of the full story. Remember that I'm not even certain of optimal orientation of the board at this stage, so in the final theory, instead of using the top left square as our first reference point, as you'll see, uh, which is black and is traditionally the reference point for us to place the white pieces at the start of the game, we may actually be more correct to explain these operations with black pieces instead and the board oriented so that the white square is at the top left. I'm not sure yet. So let's ignore the colour of the pieces for now until I nut out that theory further later and make a second video when I've considered the concept further. For now, we can place our number, which represents unity and singularity, the number one, in the top left square of the chessboard. I'm going to try and provide more qualitative operational terms like singularity, doubling and tripling rather than referring to the numbers so much as it's the operations that I believe are most critically important to be able to quickly memorize the theory with ease and be able to teach it to your children or a friend over a game of chess. First, we need to use the first simple operation we all learn from the Abha cipher in VBM, doubling. We can fill our doubling sequence from the singularity down the left vertical column of the board or on the vertical axis like so. I've represented this doubling sequence with the pawn as each doubling operation occurs from a single step on the vertical axis. I included the black pawn on the other side to represent my hypothesis that there is an inverse sequence occurring using the black pieces as operators, but as I say, I won't continue referencing that theory any further yet in this video. Then on the top row, instead of using the division of the squares, we now use the division of the checkers by three, as you can see shown here. And we do this to flesh out a tripling circuit from the unity on a horizontal axis. I've represented this operation with the rook as it's able to move more than one square on the horizontal or vertical axis. Then we then flesh out the rest of our one polarized half of the chessboard using our doubling and tripling operations on the vertical and horizontal axes. Lo and behold, we have reconstructed a good portion of the key harmonic numbers that we find referenced in the Theory of the Music of the Spheres, the Christian and Vedic scriptures, and referenced extensively by Malcolm in the Plasmoid Unification Model. And in this case, using only a chessboard, the number one, and the two simple operations of doubling, multiplication by two, and tripling, multiplication by three, and guided by the dual divisions of the board's grid of squares, and also by the black and white checkered pattern. We can refer to our horizontal doubling and vertical tripling axes as being at a numerical ratio of one to one another uh, of three to two, a perfect fifth harmonic interval. We can also discover an important cornerstone of sacred geometry, uh, the right angled triangle, demonstrated here showing the relationship between 12 and 16 which is stated to represent ether and matter respectively in the plasmon unification model. 
The relationship between 12 and 16 demonstrates a perfect fourth harmonic interval at a ratio of 4 to 3, or a decimal ratio of 1.333. It's a repeating number. We can then explore some of the operations that occur if we move the other pieces via their well-known and pre-designated paths. The bishop, who moves vertically, also shows us a multiplication sequence based on the number 12. I'm not sure if it's correct for me to refer to this operation as base 12 multiplication, but like another of my favorite teachers and inspirations, Michael Faraday, I can only credit myself with a primary school level understanding of mathematics. So I hope you can forgive me on account of my occasional accidental misuse of correct terminology and still see the credibility and interest in this theory. If now we instead take the movement pattern of the knight to the right and down, we can find a sequence of numbers linked through this pattern by multiplication or division by six, inversely. Counting the squares moved on the horizontal and vertical, we can again find the ratio of three to two, the perfect fourth. I refer to this alternative operation that can be formed by the knight if we move it to the right and down as doubling and thirding, or inversely, tripling and halving. Someone let me know if there's um, other terminology out there already for this. Okay, so I originally learned these next so-called theosophic operations from Pappas' famous book on the esoteric mathematics hidden in the deck of playing cards, Tarot of the Bohemians hence the referencing to the terminology he used in his dissertation. We can reduce all multiple digit numbers to their mod 9 base numbers by adding together their individual digits and taking their sum, as shown here in this graphic. And I use the king to represent the theosophic operations, because although he only moves a step at a time, he can move in any direction. So taking a quick recap, we can begin with unity, or singularity, 1, placed in the top left corner, and then highlighted here, we can see the integral operations we have shown so far encoded into the first six squares of the board that we have filled in here. The relationship between one and two, uh, demonstrating doubling and represented by the pawn. The relationship between one and three, demonstrating tripling and represented here by the rook, just by my determination. The relationship between 9 and the first vertical 9, which demonstrates the mod 9 reduction of 18 using theosophic reduction, represented here by the king. The relationship between the 1 and 6 showing multiplication or division by 6, represented by the knight. And the relationship between 3 and 2 demonstrating doubling and thirding, or its equal and opposite inverse operation, tripling and halving also uh, represented here by the knight. We can then, of course, repeat our simple doubling and halving operations on the full horizontal and vertical axes and observe, as we have already done previously, the relationship between three and four, represented by the bishop. Highlighting another aspect of the Mod 9 harmonic chessboard, we can easily find the doubling sequence of the VBM Mobius circuit, beginning with the one, our reference point, unity and then the separate circuit of the oscillating 3 and 6, representing the polarized vortexes of the toroidal magnetic field. And again, we can find the individual doubling sequence of the 9 on its own, representing the poloidal or hyperboloidal dielectric field, which is always reduced back to itself again using the mod 9 reduction operation that we've already learned. You can check out my previous video on Marco Rodin's Abha Cipher if you'd like to see how these numbers can be mapped around nine points of a circle, and then how the doubling sequences can be geometrically observed via the Mobius circuit of the 124875, and the separate baseless triangle connecting the 6 and the 3 through the 9. In VBM, the 6 and the 3 are, are an oscillating masculine and feminine polarity to each other, both expanded from the 9, which is the neuter on an angle which Marco claims represents what he calls the W-axis, W-axis in 2D on this cipher, the omnidirectional path of the spirit, in other words. Pappas referred to this as theosophic addition, and in this operation we take any modular 9 single digit number, uh, as we showed in the previous image, and we methodically add together the sum of its fractal parts. For example, 7 equals 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7, which equals 28. 28 is 2 plus 8 equals 10. 
10 is 1 plus 0 equals 1. And so 1 is the fractal theosophic root of 7. And in this way, we can find Pappus, Nikola Tesla, Marco Rodin, and Malcolm Bendel's favorite magic numbers, 3, 9, and 6, accompanied by the 1 or the unity, the reference point, being the fractal modular 9 roots of all of the most harmonic numbers, and indeed all numbers. I've been told that this is called the triangulation of numbers uh, in conventional mathematical terms as well. But returning to our harmonic chessboard in its expanded numerical form, uh, we can explore some dimensional unit and order of magnitude shifting operations, uh, which I've chosen to represent as being performed by the queen, who is able to move in any distance in any direction. Quite appropriate, I think. We can adjust the magnitude of any of the numbers simply by adding a zero for each increase of an order of magnitude. For example, the radius and the diameters of the moon and the sun can all be found in the far right column by adjusting the order of magnitude of these base numbers. As an aside, the plasmoid unification model shows us uh, already that the order of magnitude of the base numbers can also be harmonically decreased by moving the decimal point or making the number a negative. So for example, the melting point of proteum being uh, minus 259.2, um, uh, an order of magnitude, or a number of order of magnitudes less than 2529.20, uh, the great year frequency. We can also easily find the so-called sun square or moon square numbers, their respective diameters multiplied by four, uh, simply by double doubling um, or moving down two squares vertically on the chessboard. And in this case, the sun's diameter 864,000 miles multiplied by four is 3,456,000 miles as illustrated on the PUM and shown by the base numbers in the harmonic chessboard example here. We can also use the pattern that the night follows again to find the sequence to divide the 24 hours in one Earth day first into 1,440 minutes uh, and then 86,400 seconds and 5,184,000 arc seconds by employing base 60 multiplication. And base 60 is of course the counting system that was uh, fundamental to the ancient Vedic and Mayan divisions of time. And that's just to name a couple of ancient origins for the time systems that we still use today. And then we can use the same method to flesh out the six days of creation as Malcolm does on the plasmoid unification model as well. So six days times 60 hours, 144 hours. Uh, times 60, 8,640 minutes, times 60, 518,400 seconds, times 60, 40,000 arc seconds. And then as another aside, uh, as I detail in part three already of the Deciphering the PUM series, we can increase the order of magnitude of um, 311,040,000 by another six zeros and end up with 3 trillion, 110 billion, 400 million earth years, or one day of Brahma in the Vedic scriptures. As I demonstrated in that previous video, all of the other important divisions of time detailed in India's historical treaties on mathematics and astronomy, like the Yugas and Deva Chakra, can then be ascertained using these same harmonic number operations. I'd like to direct your attention to one last notable observation for this video, if we expanded our established tripling slash thirding and doubling slash halving grid past the boundaries of the board to the left, the next black square to the left of the four would logically be the decimal number 1.33333 and so on repeating. This is the ratio uh, we determined earlier between the numbers 12 and 16. And it's the decimal notation of a perfect fourth or a ratio of four to three. And Malcolm refers to this on the plasmoid unification model as the ratio between ether represented by 12 and matter represented by 16. And this is about as far as I've come with this harmonic number theory decryption of the chessboard currently. I was only inspired by the idea just last night. Um, however, like I say, I have a very strong hunch that we could fill in the remaining columns of the board just by visualizing the equal and opposite halving sequence, which we can also again already find hidden in Marco Rodin's Abha Cipher. Here's a couple of slides from that video uh, that just demonstrate the halving sequence that I'm referencing here. But like I say, I've only spent a few minutes speculating on this idea so far, so it's best left for another video when I've had time to consider the idea properly and see if it fits. 
I'd like to offer full credit for the discovery, if you can call it that, to my teachers, two of the greatest scientists of our time, in my own opinion. The man 396 years ahead of his time, Marco Roden, the pioneer of vortex-based mathematics, and the indomitable Malcolm Bendel, the man of the hour, who has reconstructed the basis for the music of the spheres in his plasmoid unification model, and is actively working to apply this form of harmonic Sanskrit mathematics to practical technology, like his thunderstorm generator. Also, special mention to Jamie Buterf, who first broke down this harmonic table of numbers from Stanford University in his lectures on VBM and frequency, his videos, uh, in a way which I could understand, and he made many of these connections himself in a different context. And I'll link to all of those guys down below as usual so you can investigate their work further. If you enjoyed this video and what I'm sharing in it, and, and what I believe is a pretty cool discovery, uh, remember to hit the like button and make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And if you'd like to help buy me some more time to work on projects like these, then please remember you can donate any amount using the link in the description, and it's very much appreciated. Thanks for watching, and uh, go and have a game of chess and start teaching all of that to someone that you know now.